God bless you. This is Dr. Courtney Pope. And once again, you are watching Living Devotions. This is the day the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. What a great time that we could come together and meet. And I'm excited because I am excited because we are doing something new uh, at our local church at the Perfecting Place and the partners of the Perfecting Place after this particular lesson, this, the inaugural, the initial, the launching message. After this message, we will meet via Zoom for our midweek talk back. And that's where we can ask questions and discuss uh, this particular lesson. And if you would like to be a part of that, you need to contact us so we can send you the number and the passcode and all that good stuff so that each Wednesday at 8 p.m., you can tune in with us and be a part of the great discussion of this lesson and all of the lessons that are forthcoming after this. Let us go to God in prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we say thank you. We thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you, God, for opening our minds uh, to, to uh, uh, bring us into your realm of creativity and whatever it takes for us to be more effective, however you want to use us to be more effective to reach the global world. Father, have your way and use us. We decree a word pandemic. Yes, Lord. We de we decree that, that those, Lord, that you have called are raising up, that you are calling and anointing to spread your word with clarity and instruction and empowerment to the global world. Father, however you seem please for this to be translated in other languages and to go from high places to low places. Use us for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, you see, I am excited. And uh, here we go, because after this, there's a whole lot of discussion that we're going to have uh, after this lesson. So today we are coming from the book of 2 Samuel chapter 9. 2 Samuel chapter 9. And again, for the sake of time, I just need to read a few verses. So follow us there. We're going to begin, we're beginning to read at verse number one. And it reads, and David said, is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Let us look now at verse number five. All right, verse number five. It, uh, well, all right. And after we read that, we find out that someone came forward and said, yes, there is a son and he's still living in a very uh, discarded place. So let's pick up at verse number five. Verse number five says, then King David sent and fetched him out of the house of Mekir, the son of Amiel from Lodabar. Verse number uh, six reads, and when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was come unto David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, Behold your servant. Verse 7. And David said unto him, Fear not, for I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan, your father's sake. And will restore, and will restore all the land of Saul, your father, and you shall eat bread at my table continually. Verse number eight. And Mephibosheth bowed himself and said, Where is, uh, what is your servant that you should look upon such a dead dog as I am? And let me read one more verse, verse number 13. And it reads, so Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he did eat continually at the king's table and was lame on both his feet. Oh my God, I only have but so many minutes to teach this, but I'm, I'm going to talk fast. I want you to get it because this one is hot. I want to talk about unexpected favor 
unexpected favor. Three little points we need to go right into, and I will backtrack to, uh, if you don't know this account in your Bible, if you don't know this particular passage or story, uh, I will backtrack a little bit, but I have to talk fast to keep it within that time frame. Uh, the we're going to talk three things, and we're talking about unexpected favor. So the first thing we need to understand, when God is ready to show favor to you, when God is turning the tables in your favor, when God is doing a new thing, a new thing for you, here's what you have to understand. The first thing God does, he approaches you. He approaches you. I am decreeing over you right now that there is favor in your future. There is favor in your destiny. Your destiny, your future does not look like what you're going through right now. And it is not all that you're in right now. There is more to your life than what's in front of you right now. David says in verse one, he says, is there anyone I can show the kindness of God to? And this is where you and I fit in as well, because we're always being preached that the blessings are coming and, and what have you. And I know this message sounds the same, but you know, Dr. Pope's teaching right about now, it's layer, but you have to catch the real meat of it, the real hook of it. I lead you to a certain point, And if I can get your attention, then I know I can bring in, open your mind and pour in the revelation. Uh, uh, we we want to be blessed, but we have to realize that the blessings that God bestows upon us is not just for us. It's not just for us to have a testimony. It's not just for us to brag. Oh, well, you know, I I I I this and I no no no. It is for it is so that God can use us to bless someone else. Oh, amen, somebody. So you have to understand that right now, this may very well be your season of unexpected favor. I know we've been dealing with pandemic and deaths and some turbulent times due, due to the political culture. Oh, but my God, I'm here to tell you right now, if God wasn't in control, it would be worse than what it is. But or what it was, whatever time you have watched this video, but I'm here to decree over your life right now. Get ready and prepare yourself for some unexpected favor. That means you weren't looking for it. That means you weren't even praying for it. You did, some of you did not even know to ask God or know that you can ask God for certain things or to do certain things in your life. But God is already on the search. He's already on the search. He's already looking for the deserved, the deserving. And you, my brother and sister, you qualify. Yes, you do. Expected, unexpected favor. But at the end of this, you're going to say, I expect favor from God. Hallelujah. Let's look at the second thing. The first thing we said is that God approaches you. Remember when Abraham in Genesis uh, chapter 12, but we will find out that when God got ready to establish another covenant with man, he chose Abraham, who was not even found to be in dead center of the will of God. Abraham had to get to a place. So there is location, but then there is also God's way of invocation. The invocation is that God already saw something in Abram. His name was Abram. Already saw something in him. All God had to do was invoke and invite. But he had to relocate Abram from his father's house and from the land of idolatry into a land he did not know where he could have a fresh start. Where there was nothing for Abram to compare God against. Oh my God. Wow, what, what word right there? So, so when God is ready to bless you, he goes on the search. He looks, he looks, he looks, he looks. He searched and sent angels to Abram to let him know, even when it was ready for the covenant to begin through Abram's seed. He, he sent three angels. Yeah. And the angels told him, by this season next year, this time next year, your wife will be pregnant with a son. David? He, God told the prophet Samuel, fill your horn with oil and go to Jesse's house of Bethlehem. I found a king. I found myself. I found for myself, God speaking, a king among his sons. 
If you want that full story, you have to buy my book, <laughs> In Search of a King Among Sons. Get it now. It's on Amazon and all of those outlets. Order that book today. It's powerful. So we understand that God approaches us by looking for us, by searching for us. He did the same thing with his disciples. They didn't come to Jesus and say, can I follow you, master? Jesus went to them, went after them, went to look for them. My God. And they followed the Savior and became great apostles unto this day. Let's look at the next thing. We said God approaches you. He uh, makes himself known. He appears to you. The second thing is that God accepts you. My God, God accepts you. Understand right now what we're about to, what I'm about to share with you. You have to understand that God is making room for you. God is making room for you. I'm, I'm going to say it the third time for the Holy Ghost because I just want to believe that somebody quickened and felt something right there. God is making room for you. Yes, Lord. Let's look at something here. Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth was, the, was one of the grandsons of King Saul. King Saul was the first king of Israel, but he was the son of one of Saul's sons by the name of Jonathan. What do we know about Jonathan? We know that Jonathan and David had a great bond, and that bond, the Bible teaches us, was, was a greater than the love that a man has for a woman. It was not sexual. It was all spiritual. Please do not misconstrue that. Because in the day we're living in now, there are different people that, well, you know, uh, Jonathan and David loved each other, surpassed the love of women. It's not, it's not connotating that that was a sexual thing. You can have a relationship. You have relationship with your father, relationship with your son, mother to her daughter, daughter to her mother. That is phileo, all right? It is a brotherly love. It is not eros. Eros is that a passionate sexual love, okay? So we're not dealing with that. We don't want to misconstrue any of that. But when we look at Mephibosheth, being this son, the Bible teaches us in 2 Samuel chapter 4 and verse 4, that when there was bad news on the horizon, that his nursemaid, because they were royalty, his nursemaid picked him up, he was young, and went to run and run for safety, and she dropped him. Mm. And by dropping him, both of his legs remained for the rest of his life. He became a cripple for the rest of his life. Imagine that, wearing royal garments, living with royal royal pleasures and, and delights, but crippled. Look how some can say life can be so unfair or how ironic to have the best of everything, but yet be dependent upon someone else. And most of the time, it would be someone who is their uh, subordinate, a servant. But we don't, that's, a, that's powerful right there. We took that apart. But we have to understand some things I want to share with you about how God accepts you. He accepts you for who you are, the way you are, so that he may transform you into who he is. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Hello. Watch it now. He doesn't accept you the way you are for you to remain the way you are. He accepts you the way you are so that you may be transformed by his glorious power and grace to be as he is. What you are will become what you was so that you be so that you can become what he is. I am. Oh my God. Somebody hears something in that. So the first thing we see here, how God, uh, David accepted Mephibosheth is the same way God accepts us through his son, Jesus Christ. Number one, Mephibosheth was broken, both legs, but he was broken. And many of you are broken inside or you came to the Lord because you were broken. Let's look at something else. You'll find it in uh, chapter in chapter six, I believe. Let me see. Chapter six of First Samuel. Uh, chapter six and verse number. Yeah, da, 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 da. I want to make sure I give you the right information. But this next thing we want to look at. Yes, he was. He uh, that was chapter four. I'm sorry. In chapter four, we read the story about what happened to him. But in uh, I don't want to give you the wrong information. But the next thing we find out is that he was hiding. Where was he hiding? Look at verse number four 
in chapter 9 in our text. It says that he was in the house of Mekir, of the son of Amiel, in Lodabar. And Lodabar was a desolate, downtrodden place. It was not a fruitful, fertile ground. It was not that type of area. So what a place to hide out. So here we understand, number one, that Mephibosheth was broken. Number two, he was hiding. But number three, look at verse number five. We're in chapter nine. Verse number five, it says, the king sent and fetched him out of that house and out of Lodabar. So he was now invited he was invited. He was broken. He was hiding, but now he is invited. When you look at verse number seven, verse number seven says, and David said unto him, fear not, for I will surely show you kindness for your father Jonathan's sake. And I will restore to you all of the land of your father, but it's your grandfather, uh, Saul, but whatever is the king's falls to his descendants, his sons and their children. So he was broken he was hiding, he was invited, and he's restored. My God, he was restored. But there's one more thing. In verse number eight, it says, and Mephibosheth bowed himself and said, who, what is your servant that you should, uh, that you should look upon such a dead dog as I? He felt undeserved. And if you really if you really want grace to work in your life, walk in, in humbleness, walk in humility before God. Understand that no matter how great the anointing of God may be upon your life, how awesome you sing or preach and can bring the house down, live in humility before God and, and make it clear to yourself and to everyone in your ear, to everyone that smiles in your face and compliment you that if it had not been for the Lord, this is all God. All glory belongs to God. It's not about you and I. It's all about him. So that applies to you and I today. In understanding how, how we are to, that God is about to bring us into unexpected favor. Mephibosheth wasn't looking for favor. He didn't feel he qualified for anything. He now know that his father was killed in battle. His other uncles, his grandfather, the king, are killed in battle. He's now living in, in disgrace and anonymity so that no one can find him, especially being the way that he is. And in, in Old Testament times, in your ancient world, any disfigurement, any disfigurement, any impairment disqualified you. God would not even accept a disfigured or lame or maimed lamb to be sacrificed as an offering unto God. Uh, even uh, many of the, the, the feeble people who were maimed or lame could not even always have access into the temple. If you had the ancient disease of leprosy, you had to live outside the city, away from everyone. And if you had to come into the city for anything, you had to make sure you Clovis covered yourself and yelled out as, a, as an announcement to people, unclean, 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 so people would know to stay away from you because of the fear of your ailment. And today, my God, too many people live in fear of their sin. And you feel that too many people heard about you and too many people know about you and too many people heard this and that about you. Well, why should you stop living while they continue to live? Why should you stop telling the goodness and the word of God while they keep listening to things and, 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 and spreading things? You do what's right to be glorified, to give God glory, and to be accepted by him. He is the beloved. He accepts you and I. So my, my encouragement to you is when if God is accepting you, but number one, he knows that you're broken. Number two, he even knows that you may be hiding out. Hiding behind the ones that you feel are more qualified. Hiding behind the activity of your church duty. Hiding even behind your excuses of why it shouldn't be you and someone else. You may be broken. You may be hiding. But I'm here to tell you now, Jesus is inviting you. You may be broken. You may be hiding. But God is inviting. And he's inviting you to come to him just as you are. Listen, you already know it. Matthew, in Matthew chapter 11. My God, I'm about to preach in here, but I'm trying to pace myself. 
Oh, Lord, have mercy. Matthew chapter 11. Why do I always teach with a, a new Bible and these sticking pages? I did say sticking. All right. Amen. In Matthew chapter 11. And you know the verse. I know the verse, but I want to read it to you. Come on. You had time to find it. Rome, uh, Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28. Jesus says, come unto me, all of you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Verse 29, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your soul. Verse number 30, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, I know we've always preached, and you, if you've been listening to Living Devotions, you already know what I'm about to tell you. We always use that for the sinner. Jesus says, come unto me. But Jesus was not addressing unsaved folk. He was addressing the religious population of this particular discourse. And they were too busy trying to fulfill every requirement of the law of Moses. And that was becoming so tedious and so challenging and difficult that Jesus said, listen, everyone, just come to me. I am the source of what all of those avenues are trying to bring you to. My God, all of your daily sacrifices, the daily prayers and petitions, the religious rituals and rites are only avenues to get you to the real, to the fulfillment. Jesus said, I've just sent a detour sign, placed a detour sign in the middle of that road so you don't have to go down that avenue. He says, just come straight to me. I have come to you. Reach out to Jesus, my brother and sister. He's reaching out to you. Jesus has come to me. Don't do it through religious right. Come to me. Know me for yourself. I have given you my word and I've sent my prophets, my servants, and I've anointed their ears to hear the voice of my mouth that they will teach the word of God to you with clarity, understanding, power, demonstration, and anointing. My God, don't you forget that right there. So you may be broken, you may be hiding, but Jesus is inviting you. And not only is he inviting you to something, but he is restoring you. Oh, somebody just raise your hand and say, restore! My God, hallelujah. He is restoring you. And this is what you have to understand what the Lord will do for you. I have to read this to you in Psalm, in the 30th Psalm, Psalm 30 and verse number 11. Psalm 30 and verse number 11, the psalmist says, you have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have put off my sackcloth and girded me with gladness. You took the sackcloth was the religious thing. I'll put this on to look meek. I'll put this on to look pensive before the Lord. I'll put this on to, so I can show them that I have a contrite heart. I didn't say contrary. Contrite, two different things. I had to say that because some of you old school folks think when the scripture says God hear those of a contrite because I heard this by preachers back in the day. Yeah, you know, some people contrary. Yeah, they are. But preacher, that's not what that scripture meant. All right, moving on. I had to, those that know me and know the story and know the era, you know what I'm talking about. And you know we're not talking about Bishop L. Colleen Wells because she taught us to work with power, clarity, and understanding. All right. I come along with power, clarity, and demonstration. All right. Here we are. So the psalmist says, you have turned from me my mourning, my M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, my crying, my sorrow, my weeping, my shame. You've turned it into dancing. God, I'm able to get up and dance, and I can only dance because I, I rejoice in what you have done in my life. You turned for me my morning into dancing. You have put off my sackcloth. You took off that religious look, that morning, what I, what I think I have to look like and dress like to be accepted by God. And you've dressed me with gladness. You've clothed me. God, you put it all over me. You clothe me with gladness and I cannot be silent about that. So you may be broken, you may be hiding, but you are invited and he is restoring you. And once you are restored, don't you walk around and say, I don't deserve this. You better lift up holy hands and say, amazing grace, how sweet 
that work, I, the sound, that's the song, but how sweet the work of grace that is saved a wretch like me. Listen, Mephibosheth became lame for the rest of his life and had to live in obscurity and hiding. But I'm here to tell you right now, for those of you preachers that follow me and follow this teacher so you can get something to teach, preach, listen at this. In spite of your fault, you still have a seat at the king's table. Did you hear that? In spite of the fall, in spite of your flaw, you are still invited to the king's table. David said, you shall eat continually. You shall eat the rest of your days at my table. That means, listen, that table means there is daily provision for you. You will have what you need to live off of every day. Why did Jesus say in what we call the Lord's Prayer? And give us this day our daily bread. Oh, come on, Dr. Pope. I'm sorry. I thought somebody else was saying that. I, I, I just, it came out of my mouth, but I can hear somebody say, come on, Dr. Pope. But listen, he gives us our daily bread. Mephibosheth, sit at the table. Listen at this. Get ready. Get ready for this. Because when you sit at the table, even if they had to carry him to the table, even if they had to carry him to the table because he cannot walk and be seated by himself. He is seated at the table. And one thing about a dinner table, there is a tablecloth that covers the table. And so while you adorn the table with the tablecloth, you put on the table the adornments that you want. You put on the table the plates and the flatware and the crystal glasses and, and the candles and all of that good stuff and the meal ready to be served. But one thing that table does it covers your flaws. Good God Almighty. No one can see your disability while you're seated at the table. Do you understand that? So in spite of your fall and in spite of your flaws, God still has a seat for you at his table. David said in the 23rd Psalm, he said he prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. And we talk, we t do more talk about the enemies than what's happening at the table. He prepares a table before me and anoints my head with oil and my cup runs over. And because of that position, because of that position of grace, now goodness and mercy follows me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord. I'm hanging around the place where that table is spread. I'm, you will find me at the table. And this table is not Denny's. This table is not talking to town. It's not Empire or any other place you call or whatever diner. This table, this table is at the king's house, the house of the Lord. And the table is spread. All things are ready. Come to the feast. Come where the table is spread. And the final thing, we said God approaches you, God accepts you, and the final thing, he adopts you. God adopts you. I'm here to tell you right now, God in 2021, Lord, I just dated this message, but understand that in your life right now, when the entrance of God's word is, you receive this word, with that entrance of the word is, then the light comes on at the entrance of your word and he turns on the light. And here's what the light is telling us. Here's what we see in the light. Simply that God is rest uh, restoring our recognition. There is a restoration of recognition coming back to you. You once were and you fell. You once did and you stopped. You once knew and you forgot. But God is restoring who you are and who you were because you are of a royal priesthood. You are chosen nation, people, a chosen nation. You are peculiar people. You are a royal priesthood. And God made no mistake when he took you and made something beautiful out of your life. Oh my, I think my time is running out, but I'm just, this just sounds so good. God adopts you. What did David do for Mephibosheth? David made him, uh, uh, David, excuse me, David adopted him into his family. That's what David did. David adopted Mephibosheth 
into his own family. And that's the same thing that God does for you and I. We're talking about unexpected favor. What does God do for us? Well, 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1. It says, Behold, what manner of love the Father, what manner of love the Father have bestowed, have laid on us, have given to us, have put on us, have, be, have graced us with. Behold, what manner of love the Father have bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. He is restoring our recognition. Lord, I pray right now that somebody just jumped up and started shouting, screaming, or running around and come back because when they come back, we'll be here. They can just rewind this. But he is restoring your recognition, who you really are, who you are supposed to be. I'm not talking to you that trying to be this preacher, trying to be this image in a pulpit. I, no, no, no. This I, I don't even know if this lesson applies to you unless you open yourself to change, renewal, repentance, and revival in your personal life. Don't go tell other people what God is getting ready to do. What are you allowing him to do in you? Behold, what manner of love is this that the Father has, that he has bestowed upon us, endorsed us with, endowed us with, the honor, the privilege of being called his son. So Mephibosheth was being restored back to where he ate the king's table, because his grandfather was the king, of the privilege of being called a prince. And God restored that recognition. Come out of Lodabar. Come out of that dry place. Come out of that barren place. Come out of your shame. Come out of hiding. We cannot see your disability while you're seated at the table. Good God Almighty. And number two, God, uh, David restored what he had. And we just said that he's back in the palace. He's living now in Jerusalem where the king's seed would dwell, the capital. David conquered Jerusalem and made it the capital of Israel. And it is called the city of David. My God. So here we are. God is bringing you into what he has reclaimed. He has established a kingdom on the earth. Our churches are nothing but embassies of heaven, but they're here on the earth to represent the great kingdom and heavenly kingdom of God. We are those ambassadors of those uh, of these embassies here on the earth. So I leave with you by saying, it doesn't matter what your disability is. It doesn't matter about your past or your flaw. It doesn't matter about the sin and the pain of your past. Understand that there is favor in your destiny. I command you, I challenge you to live this week, this month, and every month of this year, and every week of each month, and every day of each week, expecting the favor of God. It could be finding $5.00. It could be reaching in your bag of your pocketbook and didn't know you had another 20. But I'm telling you, it's not all finance. It's not all money. But expect the favor. Expect that doctor's report to be totally different than what you fear and even what the doctor feared. Expect those enemies to come back and say, I apologize because I want to be restored in the unity and the bond of peace. Expect, oh God. Fan, fabulous and fantastic miracles. Expect the phenomenal from God's provision. Unexpected favor. You may not have been looking for it, but it's looking for you. I pray that you will grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Blessings and peace be unto you until the next time. God bless you.